This conference will now be recorded. All right, folks, good evening. So I appreciate you all attending this evening, and I hope that the review was uh, good for you as far as for that uh, first few chapters for the test number one. I'm trying to do all that I can to uh, help prepare you for your final exam. And so we will do a final exam review uh, come uh, the week before the final exam, so just know that. Um, tonight there, I would like to go over these uh, two videos uh, regarding uh, action potentials. So I shared with you the first video uh, going back maybe a week or so ago regarding the resting membrane potential. Tonight there I'm going to go over uh, two more uh, uh, videos regarding the action potential and I'm going to uh, give you some commentary as I go through them and go through them uh, slowly so that this way you'll be able to review them on your own. So let's begin as far as this is concerned. So this would be for generation of an action potential. And you'll see right here, right now, that we have these multipolar neurons, right? So we have the dendrites and we have an axon here, okay? And so you'll watch as far as uh, seeing here, neurons send signals all over long distances by generating and propagating action potentials. So let's begin. Now, you recall that we've talked about these terms, axon hillock, initial segment, the axon, the axolemma, the axoplasm, right? So we've talked about and reviewed, and they're in your notes, all of these terms. So you, you need to continually remind yourself and review these information. But you'll see here that at the axon hillock, this is that, um, that triangular area, right? So the, the apex of the triangle of the axon hillock would be at the B, at, would begin at really the, uh, or end at, let's put it that way, the ax the initial segment of the axon, okay? And this is where, at the axon hillock, the action potentials originate there, and they're gonna travel in one direction. So again, there's only one directional flow, and in the third video that we're gonna be looking at, you'll see uh, how it's explained regarding how, um, and we talked about, we mentioned about regarding um, absolute and uh, absolute refractory period, and how it can't go in reverse as far as the action potential. They only go in one direction, from proximal axon hillock to distal at the axon terminals. Now, what you saw there also, folks, just to remind you, is that that was, a, um, was not a myelinated axon. Okay? That was an unmyelinated axon. So recall that we know that uh, the resting membrane potential, a little bit positive in the extracellular um, area region outside of the plasma membrane, or inside of the plasma membrane, intracellular would be negative. So positive, negative, that's the conditions for the resting membrane potential, okay? So now what's gonna take place is that we already know that there are um, leak channels. The leak channels and the sodium potassium pump contribute to that there's a greater concentration of sodium ions and chloride ions in the extracellular fluid, and there's a greater concentration of potassium ions and negatively charged proteins intracellularly, okay? So you'll see here where it says a closer look reveals that during an action potential, voltage-gated channels open and close, altering the permeability of the plasma membrane to sodium and potassium. And know that it's always sodium that's primarily moving first regarding these, um, these uh, voltage-gated channels, okay? See, so sodium ion channel, voltage-gated channels open first. So realize that we have depolarization and then we have a repolarization. But in between that, we have a hyperpolarization that you'll see in this video. And then it returned to uh, repolarization and returning to that resting membrane potential of a negative 70 millivolts. That's you know the range, the, the average.
Now, when it does that, what's going to happen here? No, there's not norma. So what will happen is that um, we're going to have from the resting membrane potential of positive on the outside, negative on the inside, it's the polarity is going to change to negative on the outside and positive on the inside. That reversal of polarity, right, that changes as a result of uh, sodium ions moving will cause a, the difference in the polarity and cause a depolarization of the membrane, which will then begin the action potential traveling from proximal to distal to the axon terminals. See, the sodium channels open first and then the potassium channels open. Repolarization, okay? It goes past that negative 70 millivolts. Hyperpolarization. So the voltage gated channels are not then moving, right? They're not open. So now it's just a matter of that there's going to be a return to then the resting membrane potential as a result of the leak channels being open and the movement of ions via their concentration gradients and the sodium potassium pump moving against the concentration gradient. So there'll be a return to that negative 70 millivolts, a return to that resting membrane potential. And you'll see there that we start from proximal to distal, right? Proximal is the uh, axon hillock, initial segment, and then distal would be the axon terminals and the uh, the interaction at the synapse uh, distal to that uh, to that neuron to this neuron right here. Now look at this chart. This is very helpful to you, and I've posted this an image of this. So do you see here? So we have here, so here's resting membrane potential, here's resting membrane potential. So we have this depolarization, this repolarization, hyperpolarization, and then return to the resting membrane potential. Now, propagation of And again, you're seeing here that this is unmyelinated. We're also going to see myelinated right here. This is a myelinated axon, unmyelinated axon. Going from segment to segment, in the case of myelinated axons, we're going to have saltatory conduction that I mentioned that term to you last class. See, so we're moving, this is unmyelinated, moving from segment to segment, from proximal to distal on the axon.
And again, I said to you last uh, class here that um, as a result of that absolute refractory period, it prevents the action potential from going um, in reverse, going towards the soma, right? This would be the soma, the neuron cell body. These are the dendrites, right? These are afferent, A-F-F-E-R-E-N-T, bringing graded potentials to the soma. The action potential travels along the axon, right? From proximal to distal. So do you see again, like I said um, earlier to you there, uh, the sodium voltage gated channels open first. So sodium moves first, potassium will follow as far as potassium voltage gated channels will then open. And again, this is, so these would be, right? So we're looking at the Schwann cells, okay? And the Schwann cells are allowing for then saltatory conduction from node of Ranvier to node of Ranvier, okay? And they'll explain it in just a moment. So this would be the plasma membrane of this support cell, right? So we're, whether we're looking at oligodendrocytes in the central nervous system or uh, Schwann cells in the peripheral nervous system, it's the plasma membrane of that support cell. So it's a fat, right? The plasma membrane is a lipid. It's a phospholipid bilayer, right? And so that's important to see also that because of this myelination, um, there's a transmission of action potentials that's much, much faster than non-myelinated uh, axons. So, so. So think of that contrast there. So we're saying 100 meters per second, extremely fast for myelinated axons and unmyelinated, we're looking at two meters per second. Again, there's going to be, depending upon the myelination, we can have more myelination or less myelination, but know that up to 100 meters per second, right? Whereas with unmyelinated, non-myelinated axon, you know, two meters per second, that's quite a difference in speed of transmission of the action potential. Okay, very good. So right now, what I need to do is I need to just uh, step away from the, the camera for just a moment here. So I'm going to, uh, I'll just keep the, I'll turn my mic off, but I'll keep the camera 
uh, sharing going as far as for this uh, for the note packet. So I'd like to look at the note packet. So um, about a three minute break, and then we'll come back to this, and then I'll, I'll ask questions before we move on to this. Okay. All right, folks. So a three minute break. All right, folks, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and I'd like to um, – Norma, so I would answer that question with not that I, not that I can recall, okay? Um, I can look that up for you, but not that I can recall. It, it always – it really, from what I, recall, what I know, is that it always seems to be just the sodium voltage-gated channel. So it, Remember, when we talk about the resting membrane potential, this is what might be giving you an issue. Resting membrane potential, there are uh, leak channels present. There are sodium leak channels. There are potassium leak channels, right? Now, remember that we said that there are more potassium leak channels than there are sodium leak channels, okay? So that's at resting membrane potential, okay? And as far as the sodium potassium pump, that's also an active transport actively moving three potass three sodium ions, moving them extracellularly, and moving two potassium ions intracellularly. So moving them from out to in as far as potassium, moving sodium from in to out, okay? Going against their concentration gradient. And so this requires ATP, this requires energy. It's an active transport. Maybe that's what you're thinking. I, I'm not sure. Okay, all right, very good. Good. So um, I want to come back and just see, are there any questions right now? I, I, again, I've, I've now shared all three of these videos. I've given you the titles of these videos also for you to look up on YouTube. I've taken YouTube videos and just put them, embedded them in this lecture and it, tried to explain them to you all. Uh, I know that it's, it's a little challenging, not easy, but this is just the physiology of uh, the nervous system and the muscular system as far as what's taking place when we have uh, communication uh, taking place in the nervous system and communication and contraction taking place in uh, the muscular system. So are there any questions that I can help you with right now or are we okay for now? And again, you can come back to my videos that I post on YouTube and my channel, or you can just go to the titles, you know, YouTube search the titles of those videos and look at them in YouTube themselves, just as far as uh, that's concerned. Um, but you know, I try to do all that I can to make sure that I'm I'm helping you and giving you as much information as possible regarding 
uh, action potentials in understanding this this challenging subject. To be honest, I understand that. I know that. Okay. All right. So I'm going to hide everyone again. I'll share my screen, and I'd like to take a look at these uh, the note packet here regarding the spinal cord. <clears throat> okay. So uh, regarding the spinal cord, you'll see here as far as uh, it begins at the foramen magnum, right? So uh, closer, more proximal to the brain would be the brain stem, and we'd have the the uh, the um, medulla oblongata. So it's the medulla oblongata, and then distal to the medulla oblongata would be the spinal cord, okay? Going from the foramen magnum, the large hole within the skull, right, to what? Level of L1, L2, approximate L1, L2. Um, you know, can vary a bit there. But it doesn't go all the way down to L5 and S1. Now, can do we have extensions to there as far as the extension of the spinal cord? Most definitely, you're gonna see that there. So uh, CSF, cerebral spinal fluid, is contained in the subarachnoid space, okay? So that's important for you to just have an understanding. And we're gonna, when we're looking at uh, this, when we're looking at the brain, I'll, I'll be taking more time and reviewing for you as far as the meninges are concerned. These are the coverings of the brain, right? The connective tissue coverings of the, the brain and the spinal cord, the CNS, the central nervous system. So subarachnoid space would be below the arachnoid membrane. So you'll see here the dural and arachnoid membranes extend to the sacrum, okay, beyond the end of the spinal cord at L1, L2. So you'll have here, and you'll see, you can see in your in uh, images and in, in, um, in the PowerPoint, what's called the conus medullaris. This is the point of termination of the spinal cord. The phylum terminal extends to the coccyx, to the tailbone itself, and will anchor the spinal cord. And the cauda equina, so this is a collection of the nerve roots at the end of the vertebral column. And so let's take a look. Let me see if I can't show you and also these enlargements, okay? Let's uh, let's go to Google and we'll just do a search. So let's look and let's see what if I can give you a uh, a nice image here. Okay, here we go. That's good. Okay, so you'll see here with this image, and let me just uh, save this image. And okay, folks. So let's get this a little larger. And so uh, just a little bit less. Here we go. Okay, so and even a little bit less. Got right there. Okay, here we go. So here we're looking at the spinal cord, right? And you'll see here that we have the uh, cerv cervical and lumbar enlargements of the cord. You'll see here also that this will help in regarding uh, just enabling the um, uh, more uh, ability for the support of uh, the nerves that are coming off. These are the spinal nerves, folks that are coming off of the spinal cord. They're coming directly off of the spinal cord. So cranial nerves, we'll be looking at in the next chapter. They are nerves that are coming directly off of the brain. In case of the, the spinal cord, the spinal nerves are coming directly off of the spinal cord itself, okay? You'll see here that we have the conus medullaris, so we're at here, like L1, L2, and then we have here the cauda equina, the horse's tail, okay? This is the extension of the spinal cord that will then comprise the region from L2 to L, S, L5, S1, okay? S1 meaning the first sacral uh, segment, okay, of the sacrum itself. Again, these are, this is fused. Here's the, the uh, um, so we have here the spinal cord and we have here the coccyx, the tailbone, okay? And you'll see here the phylum terminal, this is what actually is anchoring to the coccyx, okay? And so you see here that we have spinal nerves, we have thoracic nerves, we have lumbar nerves, and we have sacral nerves that are actually coming out of those openings, right? The foramina. So here we have the posterior sacral foramina. This is where those uh, spinal, sacral spinal nerves are exiting out of the uh, sacrum itself. I'll post this image for you in addition to the other image of the regional terms on in documents and resources, okay? Let's go here, back here, okay. Um, I said to you that, so 
And so, and and I did mention this, but I want to re-mention this. So cervical and lumbosacral enlargements, I just showed you them, you know, able to serve the upper and lower extremities, okay? So uh, aping to contributing to those plexus of groupings of nerves that will go to upper extremity, go to the lower extremity. Now, know that in the spinal cord, okay, uh, the H, the butterfly, the H that you see as far as uh, anatomically, and let me show you, let's look at an image of the spinal cord. So we have that. And so look at this image right here. Let's save this image. Okay, so here we go, and let's make that bigger. So we're looking at here, this is dorsal, this is the posterior aspect that we're looking at, and ventral, this is the anterior, right? So posterior, anterior, okay? And so what we're looking at here, the gray matter is the inner portion, and the white matter, myelinated tissue, is the outer portion. Know that in the brain, it's opposite. The gray, the gray matter would be external, right? The cort cortical, and also there are there are spots of gray matter internally, but primarily it's external. And the white matter would be internal, okay, inner portion of, of the uh, the brain. But as far as the spinal cord, it's opposite. So they're opposite as far as their presentation of gray and white matter. Okay, here, all right. So you'll see here as far as uh, white and gray matter, we've re we've reviewed that. As far as as far as the spinal nerve is, is concerned, so we're going to look at in talking about the cranial nerves coming directly off of the brain that they can be a matter of sensory, as far as their ability to carry sensory information or motor right output, or do they contain a combination of both? Okay, well that's cranial nerves. In the case of spinal nerves, they carry both. So they carry sensory information, sensory neurons, as well as motor neurons. So let's go back to that image here, and we'll see that, go here, here we go. And, oops, sorry, I gotta bring it back. So sensory input will be here, dorsal. Motor output will be ventral, okay? Motor output will be ventral. So we'll have sensory input, we'll have motor output. So sensory input comes via the dorsal roots. Sen um, that's sensory input, dorsal roots, motor output, ventral roots. And that's gonna, and you'll see right here, sensory input enters the CNS spinal cord through the dorsal root, motor exit, motor output uh, from the central nervous system through the ventral root, okay? Ventral is anterior, dorsal is posterior. Okay. You'll see here as far as the coverings, the epineurium, the perineurium, the endoneurium. Okay. And you'll see here as far as uh, the gray matter is concerned. So representing that that um, H or the or 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 the butterfly shape, depending upon where you're at in the cord. Okay. So depending upon where you're at in the cord, we'll have this presentation of the gray matter. It'll look more like an H. Or more like a butterfly, and we'll see here that we have these dorsal and ventral horns, okay? And they can be different depending upon what level of the cord you're at, okay? And really, I'm not asking for you to memorize uh, these terms as far as the columns are concerned, as far as the horns would be would be important as far as understanding that we're you're going to be receiving right the the posterior or dorsal horns are going to be receiving sensory information the anterior horns will be what motor nuclei okay so that that is important for you to have an understanding that sensory nuclei because it's gray batter so it's going to contain uh, the uh, the neuron cell bodies right the nuclei present within the central nervous system. This would be in the dorsal, post, AKA posterior horns, and the anterior horns for uh, motor nuclei. Okay, that's very important to, to know that. But as far as uh, this other information here, you just please review and look at and know, again, where sensory input's coming in, 
motor output is exiting. This is uh, interesting here, as far as in the central nervous system, bundles, bundles of axons are tracks. How about axons in the peripheral nervous system? They're known as nerves, right? So tracks are bundles of axons in the central nervous system. Um, nerves, they're called nerves in the peripheral nervous system, bundles of axons, okay? That is important for you to know. And understanding that an ascending track, so if, if we have an ascending track, it's going to be taking information to sensory input to the brain. Descending tracks will have motor output via the spinal cord to the, the uh, peripheral nervous system, okay? So a nerve plexus, a braid, a, a, a gathering of nerves, okay? Again, this is peripheral nervous system. We're looking at, and you need to know these terms right here as far as uh, cervical, brachial, lumbar, and sacral plexus. Okay, so you will have to commit this to memory, this information here. The cervical plexus from C1 to C4, as far as those spinal nerves. And again, know that spinal nerves are mixed nerves. They carry both sensory input and motor output. Whereas cranial nerves can be sensory only, can be motor only, or can be also mixed carrying sensory and motor, okay? But as far as spinal nerves, they are mixed nerves, carrying both sen uh, sensory input and motor output. So the cervical plexus from C1 to C4, brachial plexus from C5 to T1. So, so spinal nerves C5 to T1 innervate, send nerve flow to the muscles of the upper extremity, okay? And then we would be looking at the lumbar plexus and the sacral plexus, they are sending information to the lower extremities, okay? Very important for you to know this. And so know that the sciatic nerve present within, within the uh, grouping of the sacral plexus of these uh, spinal nerve roots, okay? As far as a, a reflex is concerned, so a reflex is something that occurs that is automatic. You have no control over the reflex other than the control would be that there would be an external control that we can elicit. So in the case of the patellar reflex, we can actually elicit it using a, a neurological hammer to elicit that reflex. And actually, I would tell you that we can elicit these reflexes throughout uh, the body of the skeletal muscles and as far as a stretch reflex is concerned. So the basic components of this reflex arc, and you're also going to see within your PowerPoint, will be present this information, okay? Um, we have here, there has to be a receptor, a sensory receptor. And now think about this for a moment. When we have information, we need to receive information, we need to process the information, and then we need to have output of what we're gonna do is in response to that input of information. So we input information, we integrate it, we figure out what we're gonna do with that information, and then we process it and and then send some type of output of information, cause some type of change to occur. So sensory receptors, and then we have motor neurons for the output of what we're gonna do as far as causing some type of change. And the integration center, this is going to take place now, this is interesting. Yes, the brain will receive the information, but the brain will receive it secondarily because what's gonna happen is that the spinal cord will respond very quickly in order to cause these reflex arcs are very fast, okay? And then yes, um, once once someone has, uh, once a clinician has elicited a patellar reflex using a, a neurological hammer, right? And the patient's leg, the lower lower leg will 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 move, right? As a result, because of the contraction of this reflex, um, yes, you'll you'll know. Oh yeah, my lower leg is moving because the clinician has just tapped on. Uh, the ligament here, right? But know that it's 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 a very fast reflex. How about look at this, the withdrawal reflex? I reach for something that's hot, and I don't realize that it's hot, but I touch it, and what happens right away? I remove my hand from the very hot object uh, because it's not because of I thought, oh, hey, dummy, it's very hot. Move your hand away. No, it was a reflex that happened between sensory receptors in my hand and my spinal cord very quickly and then the brain gets into it like whoa hey ouch that's hot put it under very cold water or put some ice on it very quickly in order to prevent the burn from continuing 
Okay. This is not going to get my needs. <laughs> yeah. Understood. Yeah. So you can, you can actually, you can do a, um, a hypothenar eminence. So on the uh, number five side right here, you can actually do that like a little karate chop to the uh, uh, initiating a patellar reflex for the patellar ligament. Uh, so yeah, so we have here the receptor, the sensory neuron, integration center, motor neuron, and the effector. And so what we're happening happening is that we have this sensory receptor receiving information, integration center within the cord, making a very quick what's, what's, what's going to happen as far as uh, synapse and a communication to motor output via the motor neuron to the skeletal muscle to contract in order to cause a reflexive action. Okay, so. You'll see here, as far as the stretch reflex, this is the best known monosynaptic reflex. So one synapse, right, uh, provides automatic regulation of skeletal muscle length, uh, and the example would be the patellar reflex. So I would like you to be able to know, uh, in particular, this patellar reflex, as far as what's taking place here. Uh, arrival of the stimulus and activation of the receptor, activation of the sensory neuron, receiving input, information processing in the, in the central nervous system, information processing at the motor neuron cell body, right, within this, the cord, activation of the motor neuron. So the motor neuron then is going to send an action potential to generate and propagate it to the skeletal muscle to cause then that skeletal muscle to contract very quickly. So we have here response to the re peripheral receptor, stimulation of skeletal muscle fibers leads to contraction of the knee extensors and will in turn allow that lower leg to extend, right? Extension. So contraction of quadriceps, right? Contraction of the quadriceps in order to allow for then uh, knee uh, lower leg extension. All right. I believe that I'm going to finish up this last page and talk about it. And uh, that'll be it for this evening as far as uh, we're concerned, okay? And then we'll, we'll move on. Uh, uh, next class, we'll uh, look at the, we'll just review a couple of the slides from the PowerPoint regarding the spinal cord, and then we'll get into uh, neurology of the brain okay, next week. So you'll see here as far as uh, you're looking at this muscle spindle, and we'll be looking at an image of the muscle spindle to realize that this is the component uh, nestled within the skeletal muscle that will actually receive the information, sensory receptors for the stretch reflex. Um, we're going to then uh, see that uh, sensory neuron will send, surround the muscle spindle and always sending impulses to the central nervous system through that dorsal route, the dorsal route. Understand that sensory input comes from the dorsal aspect, the posterior aspect of the cord, and then the motor output exits via the ventral, the anterior uh, route uh, of that in, and into the spinal nerve and then going to wherever it needs to go as far as a uh, the extension of that is concerned, wherever that may be, as far as innervating uh, whatever muscles, whether it's upper extremity or lower extremity. Okay. Postural reflexes here, as far as uh, many stretch reflexes that help to maintain upright posture. So there's continual sensory input because, so know this, right, for postural reflexes, that you're not, as you sit at your desk, as you sit at your table, as you sit wherever you are, as you stand, whatever position it may be, but you maintain a posture that you're upright, right? You're not just, you know, you're not just slumped over, right? You're upright. So there's, but you're not in a con condition where you're like, you know, you're like, ah, you know, really tight contraction of the musculature. There's, there's contraction, but not all of the muscle fibers are contracted, right? But just enough to maintain posture. And where your body is receiving input as far as the position that you're in, and then the, the brain, the central nervous system will will determine how much um, musculature, how much muscle fibers of the musculature, the skeletal muscle, should be contracting in order to keep you at that upright position, no matter whether you're standing or sitting. Okay. Um, withdrawal reflexes, I mentioned this to you earlier there, as far as uh, what takes place as far as uh, touching something that's uh, that can be damaging to the body, like something very hot, or how about uh, in the case of touching something that's very sharp, that can also be a situation where, you know, you'll move away. Here it says strongest uh, withdrawal reflexes are triggered by painful stimuli, okay? And as lastly here, you'll see here as far as uh, the withdrawal reflex an example, okay? So grabbing an unexpectedly hot pan causes pain receptors in the hand to be stimulated. 
sensory neurons activate interneurons in the spinal cord. So let me just show you this here. So interneurons would be present here within the gray matter, okay? Interneurons would be present in the gray matter, okay? And so they are, and interneurons, if you recall, I mentioned this in chapter 10, in the beginning of chapter 10, when we looked at uh, different types of neurons, we said that interneurons are only present within the central nervous system, okay? Come back to our notes here, okay? Uh, here, okay, so, um, and so what's gonna happen, and, and know this is that um, some neurons will be activated and allow for contraction, but other neurons will be inhibited from contracting. Case in point, right? Um, so if we want, uh, if a reflex is that we want uh, flexion to take place, right? If we want to have, a, if, if I want to have the biceps brachii uh, contracting, right? and the brachialis, if I want those to contract, but I don't want the triceps brachii to contract, right? you'll have to um, send a stimulatory stimulus for uh, the one skeletal muscle, the group of skeletal muscles, and then inhibitory for the opposite, so the we would say the antagonistic muscles. If you had both contract, what would happen? You would just have a straight arm. Right? So you can contract both muscles, you can have some type of contraction of both muscles to an extent, but it's just going to allow for um, a really no movement, you understand? So case in point, think of uh, quadriceps and hamstrings. They are antagonistic muscles. So if I want to contract the quadriceps, then I want to send a stimuli, stimulus to the skeletal muscles of the quadriceps, but I want to inhibit a stimuli from reaching the hamstrings because I don't want them to contract at the same time. Does that make sense to you, right? So you're going to have activating of motor neurons and inhibiting also uh, motor neurons to the antagonistic muscles. So look at this here as far as you're stepping on attack. And so this is where you're showing as far as flexors and extensors, one will be in, uh, stimulated, one will be inhibited. So flexure uh, reflex pulls the injured foot away. So if I have my right foot hitting something sharp, oh, right? And so what's gonna happen? Well, the flexors will pull my foot away from the sharp tack, right? So the flexors, flexor muscles will be stimulated, but the extensors will be inhibited. But on the opposite side of my body, opposite muscles are going to be stimulated and inhibited so that, to maintain balance. Because if you don't do this, then you'd fall on the floor, right? So see here, that on the one side of my body, the, uh, the side of the body, so my right foot hits the tack, it's very sharp, ouch. So what happens? My right side, so the flexors will be stimulated, moving my foot off of the sharp tack, the extensor muscles will be inhibited. On the other side of my body, the left side will have the extensor muscles will be stimulated, the flexors will be inhibited, and so we're allowing for, so that we're not falling and it's helping to maintain our balance. That's what it means by crossed extensor reflexes. One side will be do, will have uh, the flexors and the extensors, whether they're stimulated or inhibited, and the other side of the body will have an opposite effect. Okay, very good. 